Hello and welcome to this uh, Instagram Live on the EU Can Beat Cancer page. We're going to have a discussion specifically uh, this evening. We're going to look at AI and how it can be used in the, the plan uh, to uh, beat cancer in the European Union, which is obviously a, also a global fight. We're going to be joined by Deirdre Clune, uh, the EPP Group MEP. Um, I can see that she has joined the live um, and she just needs to request that she can sort of participate in it. But uh, I'll wait for her um, to do so uh, and I'll introduce myself. My name is Jack Parrick. I'm a, a Brussels-based correspondent and presenter um, and we are uh, and I follow uh, the EU Can Beat Cancer plan pretty intensively. Uh, uh, and so we're going to have a discussion um as I say, about we're going to focus this on uh, artificial intelligence, how it can be used. I'm just going to see if I can maybe invite uh, Deirdre to join uh, the live. Hi, there I am. Ah, Jack, yeah, we got sorry. You. How are you? It's Good. okay. No nice worries. to it's... see you. Sorry, we were <laughs> struggling with the headphones, would you believe it, and all this technology and a basic... Anyway... <laughs> There's Thank always you. there's always a problem. Yeah, I, I I actually I've just found out a way that I can invite people to join. So that's nice. I've just learned Good. something there on Instagram Live as well. But welcome. Where Thank are you? you? How are you? What's going on? Where am I? I'm in Cork, Ireland, South. I'm good. Thank you. Um, surviving, working away, working remotely all the time. Although yeah. traveling sometimes to to Brussels, uh, you know, uh, depending. We went over for plenary last week now, but. Travelling yeah, exactly. is, is not as easy as it was. Hop on a plane, choice of flights, go through London, go through Paris, go through Amsterdam. It's very limited, so uh, I've, it makes I've it more some, difficult. Yeah, I've got some work travel coming up in, in a few weeks' time, and it's uh, proving to just be an absolute headache. Anyway, we'll, yeah. focus, we'll okay. focus on yeah, the topic good. of the day. On it. <laughs> we can all talk about the pandemic <laughs> till we're blue in the face, hey? So let's, let's focus on this, this issue. As I say, um, any of our viewers, anyone that's joining us, on this Instagram live, please feel free to put any comments, any questions you might have for Deirdre, any questions about the EU Can Be Cancer Plan, how artificial intelligence is used, any questions, anything that you want, we will, we will try and answer. We'll go for about 15, 20 minutes on this live um, to have a discussion. So I've got a couple of questions for you, um, Deirdre, that we can start with. And I think firstly, I think we need to look at exactly what the EU Can Be Cancer Plan is. We know that um, 40% of us will probably face cancer in our lives in the European Union. Can you explain just from the sort of base level what the EU Can Be Cancer Plan is, why we're talking about it, why the European Union is doing it? Yeah, I, I can, what I can, I hope I give it a try anyway. To beat cancer is one of the priorities of the Commission in this term. Uh, as you mentioned, like 40% of us will face it uh, and, uh, in our lifetime and so we're all going to know so somebody uh, either in our family or our close circle of friends or work acquaintance wherever uh, um, who face cancer so and there is a lot can be done to prevent it and that's what this is looking to have a, this plan to have a holistic approach a complete from lifestyle environment uh, uh, research and treatments diagnosis care plans right through to living with cancer, those that survive it and they may have long-term consequences and they're, they're in indeed the environment that they've been living in and working in, whether it be financial supports, access to employment, life insurance, all that kind of area. Um, you know, it, it is a, it's a life-changing diagnosis for people and their immediate family, friends. So what we're looking at in Europe is, you know, to Look at look at every aspect of it. What can we do in terms of legislation, in terms of awareness, and in terms of improving improving healthcare, diagnosis, and indeed treatments uh, for 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 patients. So it's it's right through. It's bringing you know it's bringing legislators, those um, uh, researchers, clinicians, uh, the whole the whole gambit across the board uh, to de to develop. Uh, an overall plan as to how we can and it's going to be cross-cutting different departments different directorates in the commission as to what can be done to improve life to reduce the amount of cancer the number of cancer patients and to improve their life their quality of life yeah i think it's really interesting as well i mean the pandemic has shown us that you know cross-border support is, is like beneficial in the european union and being able to work together anyway so let's let's focus now perhaps a bit more on the the the, the focus of this 
specific life, which is artificial intelligence. Mm. There's going to be a hearing in the Becker Committee, which is the committee in the European Parliament that is specifically focused on this issue of beating cancer. That's going to be on May the 27th, which is tomorrow. But if people are watching this uh, uh, in the future and um, watching the recording of it, then it might have already happened. But can you tell us what you expect to hear, what's happening in that parliamentary hearing um, and a little bit about the, the sort of use of AI? Yeah, I can. The hearing is on Thursday the 27th. Yeah, looking at how AI can improve um, outcomes for cancer patients. How can help clin clinicians as well. So I expect we'll be hearing and we will get a report on its use currently, the value of it. I mean, I've read a bit about this and it's, um, it, is, it has a huge role to play AI, artificial intelligence. In terms, you know, and, and for, for, to make AI successful, what's, just, what's really important is quality data. So what AI can do for, say, for clinicians or those involved in maybe in treatment of cancers, bring a lot, a lot of data together and, you know, give, give information to those that are making the decisions as to what can be out, best outcomes that can be expected, how to have a precision targeted approach to the particular cancer and, and you know and it can develop a, a personalized medicines then a personalized approach for the patient so it you know that's just a small aspect of it but but it can be really important in diagnosis and uh, precision treatments and indeed it can be very beneficial as well in surgery and guiding 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 the surgeon if you like through ro with with robotics to get to the right spot and uh, yeah and through um, successful imagery so that that's Basically, what we're going to hear from from the um, from from the report t tomorrow, or from the hearing, and and I will ex expect that you know there'll be a lot to be pointed out to what more can be done in the area. We're doing a lot in terms of the AI Commission has produced in their proposed regulation in for artificial intelligence and how we can improve consumer confidence in that. So, you know, we'll be hearing a lot about that data as well. We'll figure figure strongly and how we can improve data uptake in the healthcare area. Yeah, and I did, I, I'm going to run through the guesses a little bit because it, I think there's, there's some really, really big names on there. We have um, Amparo Alonso Betanos, who's the president of the Spanish Association for Artificial Intelligence. Yeah. I think this is one of the really interesting things that's happening um, is, is these committee meetings are joining, um, you know, the experts from different areas. So this is a guy that's really specific on uh, artificial intelligence, but there's also people like Arta Kovalak, who is the Department of Molecular Diagnostic at Holy Cross cancer center um and these so so the, 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 these these opportunities are really really important uh, and people can obviously go to uh the 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 um the european parliaments and the epp groups uh, uh websites to find out a little bit more about this now on this uh, th there was a hearing before and a guy called Moziar etimadi it was really really interesting and we spoke about oh, yeah. it we, you and mm -hmm. i did a podcast on this didn't we mm -hmm. um and he's a research assistant professor at Northwestern University. If I'm at liberty, if you don't mind, I'll read what he said, because I think it was really interesting to me. He said, you can show a radiologist two images of a ca person with cancer and a person without cancer. And you can then show a machine, like an AI machine learning. I I'm no expert in either of these things, but this made it clear to me. And that you can repeatedly show them diagnostic pictures of either and in fact that after a while the uh, if after 40,000 examples the AI was as good if not better at identifying cancer mm. um, from those things so it just shows that it can move much more quickly rather than having tired doctors sort of trawling through pictures like this uh, to, to try and find the diagnosis that actually AI can be can be used in that sense so I wonder if you can talk to us for, about it maybe Deirdre from a policy perspective where are we because AI is AI policy is still sort of coming through and then the cancer policy where do you see this at the moment well ai policy is just starting really even though i know we have a lot in the area of gdpr general data protection uh, privacy we have we have some regulation uh, but we don't really have an overarching regulation that that controls it. what we want to build up through regulation is that we can, to build consumer confidence and trust so we've trustworthy ai that people know it's being supervises supervised that there are limits you know and certainly when you're talking about healthcare you're dealing with people people's lives 
So um, that's what we considered a very high risk area. And there must be strong regulation in that and controlling it. And, you know, if you're going to use AI, great, because it has its advantages. But who's overseeing it must have human oversight as well. And I think all that this, this we want to build into the regulation and it's there in the Commission's proposals. Last month, they produced um, some proposals in this area. We had our own report in the par Parliament recently, uh, again, outlining similar um, approaches that we would like to see to build the trust, human-centric, and it must be ethical as well. And if you have those, those stitched into your regulation, into your legislation, those, those principles, uh, I think you can uh, really, you know, move forward in the whole AI, AI area. You know, because, you know, science is great and it's wonderful and it's solving all, all our problems. We turn to science, look what we've done in the last 12 <laughs> months with, with COVID. Um, but it needs to be controlled and supervised uh, for, for the benefit of society as well. And citizens need to know and they want to know that, you know, this is good, it's happening, but that there is an oversight there. Totally. I mean, uh, not, to, not to be too sort of morbid, but I mean, we are talking about beating cancer, but a, a, a diagnosis of terminal cancer is probably the most delicate medical issue you could possibly give to... I mean, I'm sure there are plenty of others, but it's pretty much as delicate as you can deal with a, with a human being, right? So the idea of only having, um, yeah, an AI do that, I mean, there has to be humanity in that somewhere and right. i think it's fascinating to see how this is going to interplay as we go forward yeah you're right you're right absolutely but but you know ai can play a support very strong supporting role as you mentioned in yeah. diagnosing the the tumor and you know for forty thousand images so that gives you um you know from a data from a quality data point of view it gives the clinic clinician a um, much better understanding and a better ability to make a precise decision as to the type of treatment the type of surgery uh, the type of, um, you know, it could be oncology treatment, whatever. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a medic myself, but I do understand that the more data you have, you can help clinicians, help oncologists, help doctors uh, to make informed choices. And that's where I, I, AI fits in. It won't make the ultimate decision, but it'll bring together data and data not just from the clinicians experience themselves but from across the board from across member states and indeed globally as well globally and that's important yeah and i mean when it came to that thing that that that, that, that researcher was t talking about when i was watching that committee meeting as well it was it's about speed and early detection mm. of cancer is absolutely fundamental absolutely, yeah. and if you can just run all those images through and some just flag like immediate treatment mm. needed then that li literally mm. could be could be life, so, life oh, yeah. saving and 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 improve proving the outcomes as well which is you know which is what we want you know for improving the outcome for the patients negative and um, reduce the invasion the invasive surgery as best we can or the heavy treatments so and and you know i think it can't be said more more i can't say it, the precision of it you know that you're giving them right treatment for the right type of cancer and that's where i ai can help so we have a lot to do in terms of the regulation in terms of getting there but i think we we know where we want to go yeah uh, we want to build consumer confidence we want to, to you know send out the message it's trustworthy we're telling you where ai is being used you will know you won't it won't be used there won't be anything um, you know, under the table for this. It's straight up. This is what's right. used. This is what it's, what it's for. And your clinician, your medic will make the decisions for you. So do I you think that'll be really important. Do, 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 do you think, citizens, do you think people will trust um, the, the advances in this technology? I wonder where, where your sort of scale of balance is. Do you think people mm -hmm. are really keen that we press ahead with using this kind of technology? Or is there trepidation among EU populations? Well, um, trust is, is very important, absolutely. Uh, and people, well, they do approach a lot of these things with, a, with an air of, not, not scepticism, but, you know, questioning, which is right. So I bet I think you've got to explain to people, you know, how it's being used, where it's being used, and ultimately that there is a human being making the decision as to its use. You know, the, the, we understand what the data, where it's coming from, the inputs, uh, this is the decision based on those inputs and a clinician will decide yes or no. And I think that that's important that you do have human oversight that is built based on ethics, ethical decisions. And uh, so I think I, I really, from what, what we've seen and heard and spoken to uh, lots of people in this area, that is the, the key. You, you have to build consumer trust in this and patient trust uh, mm. when we're talking about healthcare, which is really, really important. 
Yeah. Now, moving on to a sort of policy area, mm. you mentioned already the GDPR, actually, and the, the General Data Protection mm. Regulation. And in some of the hearings on um, cancer and, and the EU can be cancer plan, some of the doctors have said that cancer registries, which are databases, banks of information, have in some cases been hampered by the GDPR, especially cross-border spread of information between cancer registries in different countries. I wonder how you see that. I wonder if you feel that sort of the precautionary principle maybe is more important, that data is immediately protected. I wonder how you see AI legislation going on this. Should, should we... I mean, what goes first? What's your priority in this area? Well, I think you're right. That's what came up in our hearings. There was an issue with GDPR and data sharing. And um, I, I think it's it's one of, you know, it's there's a number of reasons. Maybe one is because healthcare is a matter for the member states. So when we're talking about cross-border sharing of information, uh, people, uh, member states have tended to approach with, with the precautionary principle. But I think, you know, when we, discussed and looked at it there are areas maybe that we could have a code of conduct in this area looked at it if the information the data has been used for healthcare purposes then it can be shared if it's anonymized uh, that's important and also this year we're looking forward to uh, well the commission is due to propose pr produce their proposals on an eu health data space so if therefore you know you can bank the data it can be anonymized but used cross-border. I think that's really important because that information is really, really valuable. Whether, say, say if you have a, you know, a 40-year-old man who has a particular cancer that's relevant to his age group or his environment, whatever, to, and, and to de-anonymize it, but to share it, that can be of enormous benefit if someone in a similar, in a different location wants to, can feed into that bank get the information and it can really help with decision making. So it's an obstacle uh, that's there that kind of was unforeseen with GDPR uh, and it has to be overcome. Yeah, it's so interesting with these things because they're, especially when it comes to healthcare, privacy and data. Mm. I mean, these are the three sort of personal things to us. So and when they yeah. intertwine, it just, it's in, inherently, it's going to become difficult, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's not not an outcome that we want to see. I think most people would would you know would find that their if their if their data well if, well if they were if their identity was taken from that data, but it was used, it could be used to uh, to benefit others. And well, I think I, I I would think that most people, most citizens, would say, of course, you know. I think, know, broad, I, broad, I, broad, I, I think, think that's it, that's and that's the that's what we should approach it from. That's the aspect in which we should approach it. I think I agree. I think humans generally would want their Absolutely. experiences. Mm. I think we all want people to learn from whatever negative, if humanity benefits from our negative experience. So one other aspect of this, though, that's interesting when we talk about artificial intelligence, uh, sort of re even removed from perhaps the medical space, is competition and global competition. Mm. The United States is charging ahead. They obviously have a lot of tech giants that have a lot of our data anyway. China has a very different sort of legislative space on this. Their privacy expectations are very, very different. I wonder what your sense is of the compet competition and the competitive nature of this. Um, yeah. are, we, are we maybe going to fall, fall behind? No, I don't think we'd fall behind. I think we're doing, in terms of AI, we're doing quite well, actually, in the research area. Maybe not so much in commercial, in the commercial sector, but certainly in research, we're investing a lot there. And we have Horizon EU now and the new um, Recovery Resilient Funds. We'll, we'll be investing, like 20% of those funding are going for um, in the digital space. So we are doing a lot in research. We do, do need to leverage more in the, the commercial sector but, um, you know, I, I'm confident that if we get, if we get the right approach in, in Europe, like we, we spoke about GDPR there a few moments ago, and GDPR was, you know, was criticised at the beginning, as an obstacle to business, you know, to draw back. Why would we hinder ourselves with that? We're competing with US and China. And here we are now, we find that GDPR is actually a leading light and other areas are saying, well, you know, what's happening in Europe, we need to do that because citizens have responded really well to it citizens and business that you know data is important it's their data needs to be protected and i think we can do the same in ai i think that's what, it's what's underpinning our own report last week in parliament and indeed the commission's um proposals as well that ai can play an important role europe can lead in this in terms of you know regulating and developing something that's uh, a system that's trustworthy uh, ethical 
and that has human oversight. That's you don't see that. You don't see that in other areas. In in, in uh, you mentioned in China or the US. So we can play a leading role here. And the thing is, it, if we have a European approach, it'll give certainty to businesses and those innovators who want to invest in it because they know this is the approach. This is what they want in Europe. I can go there, and I know I, I won't have any different. I won't have a different approach in different member states. You know, if it's a common EU approach, you will develop. Um, certainty for businesses and for investment and for innovators and that's what we want Europe to play that leading role and to be a, a space for innovation in this area so you know it's an exciting time and um, it's an exciting time for the whole AI area and uh, I think that Europe is leading globally in terms of regulating to build consumer confidence and consumer trust, trust I think is something that's very, very admirable and something we should all be proud of yeah, and also I think one of the aspects of this is it's good to have the reputation of protection. And I think when you look at one, one of the big things in the cancer plan and the issues is, a, you know, ge geographic uh, divergences between survival rates mm. and access to healthcare and stuff like that. And when we talk about AI, you know, there are countries, um, you know, in, in different areas of Europe that, that don't have the support and the accessibility to perhaps the technology that, you know, the Germans, the French, whatever, are going to have, the Irish, obviously, as well. Um, and, and the question is then, if we can make the legislation solid, then it can be used and the technology can be used properly and actually sort of flatten that inequality out, right? That's exactly it, yeah. Flatten the LT inequality. So that if you have cancer, or if, you, that if you get cancer, your treatment and your outcomes will not, be influenced by your address or your location in Europe. You have the same outcomes across Europe, same level of diagnosis and living in the same environment, uh, same protection. So that's what we want, you know, that if you're a European citizen, it should be the same everywhere. Yes, I think so that's a, an admirable goal. Yeah. And that, well, that's what the, the, what the, cancer, the beating cancer plan is about. And uh, exactly. really, really appreciate your work on it and all the other MEPs that are working. I think it's really important work that's being done in those committees, with the, especially with the expert panels. Exactly. Yeah, it is. It's good. It's, it's really exciting. I feel, you know, the, the, we've, we're having some great hearings in the Becker Committee, the Beating Cancer Committee, really important hearings. And what's, what's good to see is that so many clinicians, so many experts responding across Europe that, you know, there is no problem with getting people to give their opinions and their expertise. And uh, it's really, it's really, really good to see it. Every month we have a, a range of experts and they're contributing and some contributing to our work. So I'm really confident the outcome is going to be a, a real good piece of work and, and positive in terms of directing how we want to go in the whole area of cancer, which is uh, a big blight in our healthcare systems. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Deidre, let's leave it there. Thank you so much for your time on our Instagram live here on the EU Can Beat Cancer Group. Anyone following, give Deidre a follow on her Instagram account and uh, share this, uh, this Instagram live as well through your account. Deidre, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Great. Thank you, Jack. Nice to take, see you again. Take a study. Cheerio. Bye.